The most terrible atrocities in human history all begin with the elitist idea that one person or group of people is better than everyone else, entitled and obligated by the fact of their virtue to reign over their inferiors. They deem themselves the moral arbiters of their societies and use variations on that pompous notion of superiority as their excuse to divide, punish, manipulate, even exploit and exterminate entire population segments, all they assure their targets and their loyal subjects alike, in the name of doing good. HBR Talk with Hannah Wallen This pattern is terrible when it involves segments of a population committing injustices against other segments and has, many times in history, led to warlike conditions within politically or culturally divided nations. Its most horrifying manifestation, however, is in state violence. University of Hawaii professor Rudolf Rummel, who has studied this phenomenon extensively and written many influential works on the subject, describes four distinct types of state violence defined on his university's website as follows. Genocide. Among other things, the killing of people by a government because of their indelible group membership. For example, race, ethnicity, religion, or language. Politicide. The murder of any person or people by a government because of their politics or for political purposes. Mass murder the indiscriminate killing of any person or people by a government, and democide, the murder of any person or people by a government, including genocide, politicide, and mass murder. Horrifying examples of each of these concepts can be found throughout history, the most well-known and feared being genocides and politicides, which often get mislabeled as genocides in common remembrance. In examining these atrocities, the average, innocent, well-meaning person is usually shocked, sickened, and confused. How could such a thing happen in any civilized society? How does a population get to a point where not only do most citizens tolerate their government's crimes against humanity, but many actively encourage or participate in them? It doesn't happen overnight, nor does it happen in a vacuum. The phenomenon is preceded by campaigns of dehumanization against the target population, usually by its political enemies, both within the government and without. In HBR Talk 143, we talked about political correctness as a means of escalating tribalism and preventing rigorous political debate. It works by using the intimidating threat of being perceived as backward, bigoted, and ignorant to coerce the public to speak and act as if the preferred realities of the elitist correct population are real, as if what is correct politically is correct factually, whether it really is or not. Think of the famed fictional example of the emperor's new clothes if the tailors were able to not just normalize but moralize opposition to textile denial. That is one weapon in the arsenal used to condition the population to condone or even collaborate with a totalitarian state, and eventually, state violence. It's also the first step in a full-on dehumanization campaign. When an elitist segment of a population singles out another segment as an acceptable target for prejudice, hostility, and injustice, the elitists use a series of tribalism exacerbating steps to walk an otherwise probably rational population down the pathway to tolerance for ruthlessness and brutality. After the elite group, or controllers of the state, establish their moral and authoritative superiority, they strive to establish the target group as inferior, morally repugnant, and malicious, undeserving of respect, and deserving of animosity. To this end, the target group is first defined around a common characteristic. Race, religion, economic status, and political descent are all examples. It is then defamed as having unacceptable traits of character, historical or collective guilt, or inferior qualities such as lower intelligence or psychological weakness. These traits aren't just treated as common problems within the target group, but as natural or defining characteristics inherent to their existence, which can be viewed by their betters as anything from an annoying convenience to an existential threat and an excuse to infringe on their otherwise inalienable human rights. 
This lends itself to demographic-wide shared blame, in which existing socioeconomic issues affecting the rest of the population are attributed to the target group via association with those unacceptable traits, and through them, with the everyday lives of its members, their economic consumption, their politics and traditions, even just their presence within the greater population. As this progresses into public shaming and scapegoating, the general population becomes hardened against perceiving the target group's personhood. They're not men, women, and children. They're villains, predators, resource hogs, oppressors, obstacles to a perfect society. This clears the public's conscience and the way for the imposition of rules and regulations that specifically restrict or obligate the target group on the pretense of controlling the level of threat they pose or drain they become to the rest of the population. They're subjugated through a combination of imposed personal shame and limitations designed to single them out from the rest of society and inhibit their ability to flourish, even survive. The elite ruling class may promote the image of a divided but tranquil society with a preferentially treated beneficiary general population and strictly controlled serf class living in parallel levels of peace under the ruler's control. Instead, as Genocide Watch describes, the state fosters extremism to drive these two groups further apart, indoctrinating and priming the population not targeted for democide to accept the commission of atrocities against the target group. The mass destruction of the target population is planned. The target group is persecuted, restricted, or excluded from their economy, their property often confiscated, they are often segregated, and sometimes even controlled in or hindered or prevented from procreation. They become acceptable targets for unprovoked violence as their identity itself is deemed sufficient provocation. It is in this social environment that a populace can be convinced to abide and endure a massive campaign of state violence like a genocide or a politicide without opposing the atrocities they witness being committed. Unlike populations crushed under totalitarian regimes possessed of weaponry that makes resistance a form of suicide, the brainwashed beneficiary population has accepted the ruling class's perceived reality that the target population is evil, inferior, threatening, and guilty, and deserving of whatever horrors the state chooses to visit upon them. What makes this mentality so insidious is that, like a cancer, it is unlikely to be flagged by the average thinker as an invasive, character-altering school of thought, but instead will masquerade as part of the host's programming or an outgrowth of his existing beliefs. He will not oppose it because he has been groomed to fully adopt it as his own set of conclusions and therefore not something he should be willing to question, much less reject. Unprepared to view his own conclusions as hateful or bigoted, he will instead engage in the most wild mental gymnastics to justify them. Or at the very least, he will swallow his bile, keep his head down, and stand idly by as his comrades in power visit hell upon his neighbors in the name of ideals he hasn't the thought, the heart, or the guts to challenge, because he can no longer tell them apart from his own. But it's okay after all, isn't it? The elites have his back, right? Everyone knows that people are too stupid to take care of themselves, to make their own decisions based on their own interests and understanding of the world around them. That's why we have government, isn't it? The general population is the moral burden of the elites, so of course we can expect them to act in our best interests. And how dare anyone question that? Who are you? Who am I to defy their will? But that's not the right question, is it? We already know who we are. What we don't know is how far we're going to let this pattern go. The real question is the one I asked you last week. So, I repeat, have you had enough? This week, HBR Talk will discuss the pattern of thought and behavior that precede deadly state violence, including genocides and politicides in comparison to the current impact of social justice victim ideologies in first world nations. We stream on multiple platforms. You can tune in to the YouTube live stream via the link in the low bar or find other viewing and listening options on badgerfeed.com.